I do want to thank <coughs> Twyla for, by the way, uh, let's go ahead and excuse the kids to go next door if we're going to do that. Um, I do want to thank Twyla for preaching last week on such an important topic, important as in the sanctity of human life. Uh, we, we had an event that we had, to, Dee Dee and I had to go to uh, up north, and um, I realized it was landing on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, which is an important uh, day of the year where we acknowledge that indeed the Sanctity of Human Life. We um, donate and we partner with several ministries here locally that have the same values. Just know that, and thank you, Twyla, again for such a powerful message last week. Uh, so, are we ready? Okay. Let's open our usual way. If you could show that on the screen, I appreciate it. I open my heart to receive from the Word of God. God's promises are true, and they are true for me. In John 7, Jesus said these words. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So that's how it's supposed to be for a believer, right? We get thirsty. We get dry. That's the way it is. Life has a way of draining us, doesn't it? We come to Jesus for a drink, and we're filled with his living water. And notice it says that we are filled to the overflow, and that's what we were made for. It said Jesus was praying that, that rivers of living water would not just fill us, but that would flow, what? Flow from us, from within. So not only does God want us to be full of his living water, but he wants us to flow into our marriage, into our spouse from us, into our kids, you know, a pouring out of what's already happening within. That's how it's supposed to be. And also here we see Jesus declaring that he is what they have been looking for. He is what they have been looking for. He said, Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, this is what's going to happen. But yet, as we know, even with the answer right in front of us, we often still search, don't we? In 1987, the band U2, uh, maybe you remember this song. They released a song called, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. I remember that song, 1987. I can't believe it's been that long. It kind of made me feel old. That's coming up on 40 years. But I remember that when it was, all, when it was called the Fresno Bible House, um, they had U2 albums there because they had a lot of references back in those days to the Lord. Um, the lyrics of this song describe a journey that the songwriter had been on, searching for the one thing that his heart needed to be whole, searching for what he's been looking for, right? The song describes different places that the songwriter had looked Achievements, maybe. He says, I've climbed the highest mountain, scaled city walls. And what? To show worth, to, for meaning, for commitment. He talked about the arms of a woman. He says, I've kissed honey lips, felt the healing in her fingertips. But he still hasn't found what he's looking for. Then the writer directs his efforts to a spiritual journey. He says, I have spoke with a ton of angels, or excuse me, with the tongue of angels. I have held the hand of the devil it was warm in the night. I was as cold as a stone. And then he further refines his search with references to Jesus himself. He says, you broke the bonds and you loosed the chains. Carry the cross of my shame. Oh, my shame. You know I believe it. But then the next words are, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I want to ask you today, what are you looking for? I mean, really looking for. Well, we can say we're looking for this. It's easy to say these things, but what are we really looking for? Each one of our lives has displayed a search for something, perhaps meaning, purpose, love, acceptance, perhaps success, achievement, money, connection. It really does come down to connection when you think about it. Nobody wants to feel disconnected. So we try to find connection with what seems to work, right? The underlying presumption in all of these things is that they will bring us happiness and meaning. Indeed, that connection we desire. And the problem is, is that in times we achieve these things that we are looking for, 
Perhaps we achieve some of the goals that we set, and yet we find that that hole is still on our hearts. So we continue to look. We still haven't found what we're looking for. You look at Hollywood, great examples of that. People achieve stardom, oftentimes overnight. Overnight success, all the things that they dreamed about, money, fame, fortune. Yet they still haven't found what they're looking for. They oftentimes lose their mind and go get kooky, you know. Sometimes we laugh at them. They're the fodder of, uh, of a gossip magazine articles and whatnot because they found out that these things that they thought they needed really didn't pay off. There wasn't a payoff there. The evidence of this is in the fact that in our own lives, whatever it is that we are convinced will bring us meaning never seems to satisfy, does it? We will need more and more. And when that well dries up, we'll tap another well. Have you ever noticed that the things that we think we need will always leave us wanting more? Amen? The things that we think we need will always leave us wanting more. More money, more success, more love, more approval of others, on and on and on. We still haven't found what we're looking for. Anyone who has struggled with addiction will vouch for this. Addiction always progresses, doesn't it? Requires more and more for the same high, for the same fix, for the same feeling. And by the way, anyone who is convinced that financial success will make you whole, I have a question for you. How much is enough? How much is enough? How much will you need to make you happy? What is it you're really looking for? So why is this? Why is this so common, this desire for meaning and connection that we are constantly looking for but never seem to find it? Because I submit to you that God created each of us with a hole only he can fill. And we will search and we will go here and we'll try this and we'll try that. Perhaps we're just running. Any runners in the house? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, that, by the way, that, that could mean a lot of things. Are we running from something? Yeah, a lot of times. But sometimes we're just running in something. <laughs> we're just running. We're just staying busy, right? Sometimes we just want to stay busy. If I stay busy, I'll stay ahead of these thoughts in my head, right? If I stay busy... I won't have to think about these things that I don't want to think about. If I stay busy, then I won't have to deal with these hurts and these things that are catching up to me. See, that's how life is. It has a way of catching up to us, doesn't it? Doesn't it have a way of catching up? That's why we have terms called midlife crisis. <laughs> you know, oftentimes most professionals say it's between 40 and 50 on the average, sometimes a little earlier than 40, but somewhere around that. That's why, you know, 40 used to be called over the hill, right? Because you know, you're on the back half, you know, or at least towards that. But I, I like to think we're living a little longer these days. Maybe over the hill is 45 now or whatever. I don't know. But that's in, the, um, that's in terms of age. But how about just in terms of things catching up to us? They say that um, Christian counselors especially say that people can stay busy and just not deal with life up to a certain point. Well, there's a tipping point, and that tipping point is usually in the mid-40s on the average. Mid-40s, closer to 50 maybe sometimes, where it all just kind of seems to catch up, right? Because we can run, we can run, and we can run, and these things sometimes are nipping us at the heels. Sometimes we have some distance on them. Sometimes we feel like they're a mile behind us. Sometimes they're right up on us, but they're still there. And when I say, when I say, when I say these things, I'm talking about our hurts. I'm talking about the things that are unhealed in our lives. Each of us carries around brokenness in one way or the other, and it manifests itself in different ways in our lives. Sometimes many of us become people pleasers. I'm just going to keep everybody happy. And sometimes we do these things as a way of pulling our suspenders out and saying, look at me. I just stay busy. I try to do this. Look at how many balls I have in the air at, the, at, the, at, at any given time. When it really, it's a mask to cover up what's going on inside, and there's a shelf life to it. Don't wait until that day expires and you have a meltdown or a breakdown. <laughs> Don't wait for that, because that does happen oftentimes. 
Anybody been there? Don't have to raise your hand and say amen to that. You know, they have different kinds of breakdowns. They manifest themselves in different ways. But it's because we have been assuming that we are meant to carry these things and just man up or just lady up and just get it done. We find ourselves, uh, we find our meaning in performing. We find our meaning in just, like I said, just staying busy. I'm just going to do all this stuff. You know, oftentimes we try to, try to just control our environment. I talk a lot about control. Fear-based, by the way. Don't have time to unpack that one. But out there, you know, if, 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 if everything is nice inside your nice tidy box, then inside that box you're in control. So that way we try to keep everybody behaving the way we want them to behave. We want to even keep life behaving the way that we want life to behave inside that nice tidy box because outside that box it's scary. Outside that box means that maybe you're just maybe you're not okay. <laughs> At the heart of the matter, each one of us has this place where we have this definition of what makes us feel okay. So that's your own journey. That's for you to under, ask and understand what makes you feel okay. What it is that you're really searching for. Sometimes we run to odd things. Sometimes we actually can withdraw and isolate. That's the way that we cope, right? Why would we isolate, by the way? Because it's safe. <laughs> or it pretends like it's safe. Because inside isola- the ring of isolation, the bubble of isolation, people can't hurt you, right? Maybe we just surround ourselves with people that we call safe and we, and we do that under the guise of, hey, I'm just making healthy choices now in my life. You know, okay, that's fine. I don't want to knock that. I get it. Sometimes you have to have boundaries. But you can't spend your entire life um, uh, sorting through and pigeonholing everything in life that is scary and unpleasant. <laughs> right? Sooner or later, it's all, the dam's going to break and it's going to catch up. One way or the other, what we've done what we look to, to escape and to deal, has a shelf life. And then we need to get more and more. Sometimes we, we even celebrate the, some of the darkness in us. I've had three or four different people over the last few years that I've counseled and been involved in their lives, and I saw that, that sometimes we can even relish our saltiness, you know, like, well, this is just who I am, you know. And I just can't help who I am. And, uh, you know, when things get crazy, we reserve the right to go back and be that foul mouth, that, that, that person that has this dark side. Well, that's, that's all that is is a mask, <laughs> right? These things are just masks. It's things that, we're, that we do to try to deal with these things that are chasing us, and sooner or later they're going to catch up. We still haven't found what we're looking for, but we're sure trying when the truth is, God created each one of us with a hole that only he can fill. In 1999, Christian singer Plum released a song called God-Shaped Hole. And one of the lines in it says, there's a God-shaped hole in each of us, and the restless soul is searching. There's a God-shaped hole in all of us, and it's a void only he can fill. So today, we've looked at two songs so far that talk about the same journey, the same searching, one songwriter realizes the search leads to God, to this God-shaped hole. The other acknowledges that there's a God, but is still searching, not realizing that the search is over. Church, I want to tell you, the search is over. You will find everything you are looking for in an intimate relationship with your maker. Amen. The search is over, and we don't even realize it. It's right here in front of us the whole time. He's been right here. Jesus said, I am what you're looking for. Then he, then he talked about the living waters and who believes in me will have this flowing out of them. Man, so, so oftentimes we have things flowing out of us, all right, but I'm not so sure it's living water that's flowing out of us, right? What's flowing out of you, what's, what's flowing out of you on an average day? I don't, I don't want to know. But I want that, I want to be so full of that living water that's flowing out. Amen. I want that living water to flow out of me into my wife. I want to build her up, not 
tear her down. I, I told her years ago, I said, you're like a flower, and I don't want to st uh, stomp on you, trample you. I want to water. I want to feed that, that relationship. I want my kids to be better off from me, from knowing me as their dad, you know? I want those that come into contact with me to leave in a little bit slightly better than, than when I got there, not the other way around where I'm sucking off of everybody with my, with my, with my sponginess and my neediness or, or I'm hammering them over the head with my anger and my, and my own um, narcissism where I just make life all about me. But see, when it's flowing out of me, that means that when there's living water that's so full in me that it's flowing out, that means that it's constantly flowing out because I'm full of it. Full of living water, that is. <laughs> I can be full of it also. But that means it's flushing out, that there's no time for that stuff to start accumulating. See? Because it's full of living water. I'm full of living water, and it's flowing out of me. That's how it's supposed to be. And you will find everything you're looking for in an intimate relationship with your father. You can break it all down, really. All your struggles are one way or the other, rooted in your attempt to find your own answers. Did you know that? Break it all down, all of our struggles. By the way, did you notice that I is in the center of sin? <laughs> it's, you can break it all down. When we're, trying to, we're trying to solve our own problems. We're trying to answer our own questions. We're trying to cope with this. We look to that. We look to that. The drug addict trying to cope has found it easier to escape to the numbness brought on by their drug of choice. The prostitute on the street has an innate desire for worth and love, but it's also blended with a volatile mixture of self-disdain, causing her to sell her body and her soul. The people pleaser, the controller, the rageaholic, unable to settle down and allow themselves to be loved as they are, where they are, or perhaps, like I said earlier, it's just plain busyness. We often try to stay busy and stay ahead of our feelings. Either way, we're unable to allow ourselves to find rest and meaning for our souls. Psalm 62 says it this way in verses 1 and 2. Truly, my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. I love that. Our brother wrote a song to that, put a tune to that years ago. And I still, after all these years, DeWitt, I, I, whenever I read that psalm, I think of your song. Another translation puts it this way. My soul waits for God alone. He alone is my rock and my salvation. And still another one says, only God can save me. And I calmly wait for him. Guys, that is truth. Only God alone is the salve for our wounded soul. Amen? God alone is the salve for the, our wounded soul. What is the salve that you've been turning to? What is the salve? I mean, you think about it that way. Really, that's what it is. A salve, we put it on our wounds. You know, well, I'll just isolate. I'll just stay in my anger to protect myself. Or I'll just be a people pleaser. I'll try to keep everybody happy all around me. Or whatever it is, it's so easy to do these things and our brokenness and our failed attempts to provide our own salve, we are, we are in essence saying to God, get this, yes, I need God, but I also need blank. <laughs> right? Isn't that what we're saying? I've been there. Trust me. <laughs> I This whole message, it, I, I told my wife, um, I, I wrote this in literally one sitting, and I wrote, I just had a few, I had a little bit of time, had some time on my hands, and I was going to just jot down some notes. That's, that's how it goes oftentimes. I just put scattered notes down uh, as they come to me of where I think the Lord's leading me to preach, and then, I, and then as the week goes, I, as it progresses, I'll put some skin on it and reformat it and get, out comes a sermon. I sat down to do that, and I, and I did not get up until this entire message was written. And it happens like that every once in a while, where it just flowed out of me. And part of the reason, I guess, is because some of this resonates with me. We've been there. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching with you. We oftentimes say, yes, I need God, but I also need blank. We could go on and on. The perfectionist, the high performer, 
the one stuck in victimhood. All of these are failed attempts to medicate and to provide salve for our wounded soul. The restless soul is searching, yet the whole time the answer was right there. Indeed, there is a God-shaped hole in all of us, and it's a void only he can fill. Now, this is not a new notion. In 1670, French, French mathematician and physicist Blaise Pascal said, what else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in, a, in man a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace? This he tries to fill in vain, excuse me, this he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are. Though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable, that means unchanging, object. In other words, by God himself. I mean, this is a notion that's been around for a while. This is 400 years ago, almost. Somebody was struggling with the same thing that we struggle with still today. Truly it is what, uh, right what <clears throat> Solomon said. He said, there is nothing new under the sun. This is part of the human dilemma that we have these holes in our hearts, that we have these, this hurt, we have these <clears throat> issues that we try to resolve ourselves when really nothing else will resolve it other than God himself. Guys, if you're lost, if you've lost that sense of wonder of God and his grace, if you feel disconnected, if you are weary from searching for what, what it is that will set your heart at rest, I just want to tell you that that's okay. There is no condemnation from God, amen? He knows anyway. You might as well admit it to him. So I say to you that God is not condemning you. Instead, he's drawing you back to himself. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, the Bible says, right? So even in something like this, in this setting where maybe I'm presenting some ideas that you hadn't considered, hopefully maybe even answering some questions. Even in this setting, there might be a few ouch moments here and there, but it's a loving father exposing, saying, my child, I am your answer. I've been here the whole time. You've been doing, yes, you're coming to me. Yes, you pray. Yes, you come to church. But, but I look at your life and it's me and this. When, when really it's all him, we find it in him, and that doesn't mean that if you seek the Lord for your essence and for everything and all the answers that you're searching for, that that means that you're not going to have anything left for your spouse. It's, that's what's bizarre about it that I don't understand. The more I love the Lord, the more I seek him, the more I'm full of him, the better husband I am. It's not God or being a husband. It's not God or being a family man and being the father I'm supposed to be to my kids. I find it in him. I find being that I can be a better dad and now a grandpa when I'm close to the Lord, when I'm seeking him, when I'm full of his presence. The closer I am to the Lord, the closer I am to my wife. That's the way it's supposed to be. The closer I am to him, the more I can fight temptation when it comes. Because it's not just a matter of gritting my teeth and going, no, 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 that's not who I am anymore. I'm not going to drink. 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 Because if I do that, I learned that 26 years ago. If I focus on what I'm not going to do, I'm probably going to end up doing that. <laughs> you know, I went on a motorcycle ride just yesterday. I was able to get away. It was awesome. And I tell you, it's true. In a motorcycle, you go where you're looking. You will go. You start looking that way, you're going to start drifting that way. That's what's different about a motorcycle and a car. You move it with your body. And it's the same way in our lives. You will go where you're looking. So I don't get up in the morning anymore and say, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to drink, unless it's that living water that he wants to fill me up with. See, <laughs> he wants to fill me up with his living water so that I'm so full it's coming out that there's no room for garbage to go in. See what I'm saying? And then all these things that I find, the closer I am with him, the more time I spend with him. When I get up in the morning and I devote my time to him, when I allow him to fill me up before the day's garbage goes in, right? That's how it's supposed to work. Then all of a sudden, the things of this earth, they grow strangely dim. 
right? Like the old song. And he starts, we talk about it this morning in our men's thing. Then in that loving relationship, God, as I grow in him, he starts to lovingly begin to put his finger on things that I'm still allowing to coexist in me. These things that I still, that I'm st- where I'm saying, God, I need, the, yes, I need you, Lord. Praise God. Oh, whoa, God, fill me up, Lord. But at the same time, I'm really in essence saying, God, I need you and I need people to be happy with me. I need you and I need circumstances to go just right. I need you and I need money. I need, you know, on and on and on. When the truth is, we just need him. Amen. So again, I say, God is not condemning you. He is drawing you back to himself. You can get it back, that feeling of purpose and connection. And by the way, if you never had it, you can have it now. Sounds like I'm dealing something, like I'm selling something. What's it going to take to make you buy today? Well, Jeremiah 2 puts it this way. The Lord says, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Well, I tell you what, that's a conviction right there. Look at the parallel here. We said earlier that that Jesus said in John 7, that anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Get that living water. And now God the Father saying in Jeremiah, they have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Okay, what does that mean? Dug their own cisterns. Well, back in those days, especially, well, cistern is still used. It's like a well. Um, but back in those days, a cistern was just literally, literally a hole in the ground. They would literally dig a hole in the ground to catch runoff from the rain. And it would hold water. And they would use that water. That's what a cistern was. And so, you know, you have a cistern that has water on it, water in it. That's pretty important. You go to that cistern just like you go to a well to get water, right? Well, if the cistern's broken, that means it doesn't have integrity and it's not holding water, right? And that's what God is saying. Hey, you've dug these cisterns. You think this is going to be your answer. You've gone to this thing, whatever it is, your addiction or, your, or the woman or the man or, or, or whatever it is you've gone to, you think that cistern's going to hold water, but it's broken. It won't hold water. When I have the living water, just like Jesus said, living water. That means water that brings life. But again, even in this rebuke that God is giving, there's no condemnation because he says in Isaiah 44, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Amen. I'm almost done. Give me, can I have five minutes? I'm a little bit over on time today, but we had a powerful prayer time today too. (laughs) So I want to leave you now with, okay, I've given you the what and the so what. Here's the now what. (laughs) Every minister, every sermon's got to have a what, a so what, and a now what. Here's the now what. In other words, what do we do with this? Perhaps maybe you are connected to God, but at the same time, you're still connected to other things that give you meaning. It's amazing, really. We say, oftentimes we say the right things and and we're even honest with our struggle at times. But at the same time, we allow that struggle to remain. Hello. I've been saying over the last two weeks that, uh, or two weeks prior than Twyla last week, that too many many things uh, are normalized Too many broken things are normalized in the church. We allow too many things to hang around. Maybe you excuse them or whatever. We allow them to hang around. We said just, we were downstairs earlier, we talked about the idea that we allow them to coexist. And really, that whole idea to dying to ourselves and crucifying the flesh like the Bible calls us to do, really, I think in a practical sense, that's one of the things that we need to do is allow or uh, identify and attack the things that we've allowed to, co- uh, to still exist in us. We're believers. 
We are, we are a church of the living God. We have living water flowing out of us, and yet we still have these little depositories that we allow things to go in. <laughs> it's supposed to be an Audi, not an innie. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? It's supposed to be an Audi. <laughs> we're, we're so full of the Spirit, it's just living water is flowing out, but yet there's some cracks. And we excuse it. Sometimes we just say, well, that's just how I am, you know, especially when things get a little awry in my life. You know, you're going to see a different side of me. No, no. No, that's a cop-out, right? I don't have God in my addiction. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. If that's the case, then my addiction is my God. I don't have God and this and God and that. That's not, I mean, I mean I'm not using the same, I'm not saying me like I'm perfect. I'm saying that's how it's supposed to be for us. And at times we even protect these things within us these very things that are going to take us down, we actually will protect them at times. I want to ask, I want to tell you, just like I told the men this morning, don't let that be your legacy. Don't let victimhood, don't let anger, don't let your addiction be your legacy. Don't let just whatever it is. Weakness. You know, sometimes we can just not say no, you know. We don't have any boundaries, you know, like, these things, they're not you. Don't let them define you, amen? It's time to navigate a new course. You know, sometimes we're like these ships, just kind of going around subject to the current because we don't have a rudder on the water. Navigate a new course, the new course to freedom, amen? Transformation. So I want to propose to you a simple and practical plan. Here it is. I'm going to close with this. I think I'm stuck here. Can you show that? Yeah, there it is. Disconnect and reconnect. <laughs> Disconnect and reconnect. That's very, very simple. I don't have to explain the, the word picture there. Disconnect, unplug it, lay it down. By the way, another key element of disconnecting is confession. So disconnecting involves confession. David said in Psalm 32, 3 through 5, 3 through, uh, 3 through 5 when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. I love that. What a picture when I kept silent, when I kept these things in me, when I tried to live life with, I need God and I need this, what? What's the payoff? My bones wasted away. <laughs> Man, I know, I've been there. I know that feeling spiritually. And maybe even, it even affects us physically. You're trying to have one foot in heaven and one foot in the world. You know, you're still trying to thing, handle things on your own. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. In other words, it's not going to work. <laughs> These things don't pay off. Is there a payoff to isolation, by the way? What's the payoff to isolation? More loneliness. <laughs> There's no payoff. You think you're safe, but you're starving yourself of the very thing that you created for, which was connection, the reason that you're hurt to begin with. What's the payoff to anger? What's the payoff to... to uh, Victimhood. We talked about victim mentality a few weeks ago. There's no payoff to that. Just isolation. These things don't pay. That's why, it's, that's why the psalmist said, your hand was heavy on me because there's no payoff. My strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer. <coughs> sapped. I got no strength. These things are not meant to do it for us because God made in each of us a hole that only he can fill. Amen? That's what that's about right there. But look at that. Thank God for verse 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you, what? Forgave the guilt of my sin. So that's what I mean by confess. Confess literally means to agree with the Lord. God, I realize I have been saying that. I need you and this. It's all right. There's no condemnation. Just admit it. That's all. Not, he's not going to humiliate you. Just get it off your chest. And by the way, it also involves changing direction. We're talking about repentance. We're talking about renouncing, breaking ties with. That's what renouncing means. 
Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Amen. Oh, praise God for that mercy. It doesn't say condemnation. It doesn't even say a lecture. You don't even get a lecture from the Lord. You confess your sins. God, I did this. And renounces them means I'm breaking ties with it. I'm not, I'm not even letting that have a foothold in me anymore. There's not an option anymore. I mean, I remember years ago when I decided I was done and I, and I was going to get sober, I, I cut myself off. Anybody that I had ever drunk around, any place that I ever wanted to drink, I stayed away from that place for at least the first year. And I found out how, what kind of friends I had, by the way. I had, really, I had five good friends at the time that were close to me, and I only left with like one or two of them because <laughs> it was all about the drinking, you know. But that's all right. And then after a year or so, I realized I could have a little bit more freedom to not completely isolate myself from these things because sooner or later I was going to have to get some strength. But that's what it is. Breaking ties with. I don't want to go down that direction. If I know that that hole or that street has a hole in it and I always fall in it, then I'm going to walk down this street. (laughs) I'm not going to walk down the same street and go, well, I just won't fall in the hole this time. That's not renouncing. Renouncing means I'm not even giving that hole a chance to get me because I'm going to go this way. That's what that means. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one that confesses and changes direction finds mercy. So once disconnected, now we reconnect. Reconnect to what? Well, first of all, remember, there's no condemnation. It's only an invitation. And Jesus said in Matthew 11, as I close, verse 28, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Reconnect to the source of living water. It's what you were made for, guys. If you fall off, get back on the horse. Amen. Doesn't matter what it is. You can say, well, pastor, you've talked a lot about addiction today. That's not me. I'm out. No, you know, we all got stuff that we're still carrying around. We talked this morning at our men's thing about revival and what that would look like and what does it mean to die to yourself. Well, this is one of the things. Being aware of the things that we are allowing to coexist in us and laying them down. Amen? For what? So that we can be brainless zombies? No, that we can have living water flowing out of us, (laughs) that we can have life itself, that we can live the legacy that we were called to live, that we can be full. You know, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. I tell you what, I want to tell you, in a practical sense, I am happier, I'm a much happier man than I was 26 years ago when I was an alcoholic. I mean, that was one of the things alcohol made me kind of, a, I was one of those happy drunks most of the time. Happy drunk, what a, what, a, what a lie that was. I wasn't even being myself. I was being fake. You require a, a, a crutch to be fun, then there's a problem, <laughs> Right? I can be that person. I can go to bed at night and sleep. No problem anymore, you know? I'm happier now. You know what? There's a payoff to this, doing it this way, I've learned. So uh, anyway, guys, I hope that you receive something from that. What I want to do is I want to close this way, and you at home that are watching on the recording, um, you can do this exercise with us too. What I want to do is I want to lead us all in a prayer, and this is practical, this is what you can do in your own time as God in your own journey puts his finger on things and makes you aware of, you know what, maybe God, I'm, I'm holding on to this. It's you and this, and I don't want it to be this anymore. This is how you can do it. It's very practical. I'm going to lead you in this prayer. Uh, so if you and everybody watching at home will close your eyes now. Father, we thank you for what your spirit today. We thank you for what you've said today and done today. We thank you for the powerful time of prayer earlier. And now, Lord, I want to do what we all need to do, God, in some respect. To some degree, Lord, there are, there's always attachments. There's always things that, that, that still want to hold on to us. So we want to lay them down, Lord. And right now, Father, I want to confess that there are things that I still believe that I need in addition to you. And I want to lay them down, Lord. Forgive me of them. I confess these things to you, God. I lay them down. 
And God, and now I also want to do what your word says about renouncing them or repenting from them means change direction. God, give me the strength to go to, to walk down a different street. <laughs> give me the strength to not a good strength to not even give the devil a foothold in these areas in my life anymore. Give me the strength, Lord, to be that person, that man, this woman that I'm called to be and live that legacy that I'm called to uh, live. And I declare in Jesus' name, this other that I'm laying down today, in Jesus' name, that will not be my legacy. In Jesus' name, that will not be my legacy. In Jesus' name, that will not be my legacy. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys.